Hi, I'm Arthur. And I'm Jessica. And we're going to be taking a little tour of the island today. What do you have, Arthur? Well, we're here sort of in the intertidal zone, but it's not really a low tide thing because these are terrestrial plants that grow below high tide. farmers markets. Um, this one here is sea blight and this is glasswort and the glasswort is sometimes found in the farmers market in Portland as sea pickles. Um, it's quite tasty um, and very salty. Tasty even for somebody who isn't a naturalist Tasty if you like salt. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> no, it's delicious and there's a little crunch to it too. A uh, little squeak that's really, really satisfying. So we found what we have kind of narrowed down to a skull cap. Um, and we're using our books to try and figure out which one it is. And one of the most important things when you are identifying herbs in the wild is to not assume that it's a thing you want it to be. So, and it's always good to have a couple of books to cross reference with because names change and pictures are different. So, I've got a Newcomb's Wildflower Guide here. And Arthur, what do you have? Flowers of Star Island. Nice. Okay, so we know that we're going to have some generalized and then some pretty specific stuff here. So, we can tell we've got the classic leaf structure opposite there and then it makes this lovely like almost diamond cross crisscross pattern but the flowers are really unique for this one because they're almost an inch long they're purple they have this beautiful little white part down at the bottom the stem is square can you see that and the stem is smooth and that's an important id factor too. So we've narrowed it down. It could be a showy skull cap, which is the Scutellaria serrata. Um, but flowers are in a single racy, so we have to we have to cross that one out. Nah, it's not because they're coming up on different sides. So what do you have? Um, I have common skull cap. Nice. And it says a common herb along the rock shore of Gosport Harbor, often becoming three feet in diameter by time of frost. Now these aren't huge, but they're, but pretty, they're pretty spread out. Yeah. And <clears throat> the clencher is that the corolla, the flower there, is blue violet with a white base, which we see. Nice, nice, cool. So common skull cap it is. And the other part of the ID is that the plant is often affected by daughter. Ooh, daughter. And here we go. This lovely thing is a parasitic plant. It has no chlorophyll. It lives off the chlorophyll of other plants. And, and it hunts really by cool. scent. Yeah. And you can find some videos online of the tendrils kind of going and hunting and finding and then wrapping around. So this one has wrapped itself around some mustard here. Poor mustard didn't stand a chance. We'll eat it though. In the most all the And we just keyed them out because we could tell a bit about them because of the square stem and the leaf pattern. So we were like, hmm, which one is this? So we we went to our trusty books, keyed it out, and it is a ba da da. Oh, we think it's a spike germander. Mm -hmm. Which? Which is known for living on rocky beach areas. There we go. Um, it's also yeah, called wood sage. Wood sage or spike germander. Um, it matches the drawing in the Howard book. However, they say that the flowers should be white, and these are a really light pink. They're really pretty. And 
in this book, it says purplish flowers. And it's always really good to see books that have like close-ups of the pictures of the, um, of the flowers themselves. And one of the other books I was just leafing through today was talking about how if you, um, if you see a plant as a purpley blue color, somebody else might see it as a red pink. And there is a ton of variety in plants, just like there are in people. So use multiple books and don't be surprised if something comes across a little bit differently, but you always want to like use multiple ID points. The stem, is it hairy? Is it soft? What do the leaves look like? What do the flowers look like? And that way you can be really sure of what you found. So there's this other uh, plant that grows in this rocky shore area. Um, which is interesting. Um, it also grows elsewhere, but it's called Orach. O R A C H, and sometimes with the final E. And you can eat this like spinach, not fresh. It has a, like a little, it's a little salty right now. A little funky, fresh taste. Yeah, but better if you post. cook it, it's better. The flowers are almost microscopic. Really close. Get a close up. But um, this may be in our dietary future because it grows on uh, in really salty soil. It grows in really hot weather, um, and it can be eaten like spinach. So in um, a stress environment. Um, that's been overused. This would be a good um, food plant. This is a fun stand of some really cool cruciferous vegetables here. We've got wild mustard and wild radish. And at first they kind of look the same, um, but we, we can identify the difference. And then once you taste them, you'll definitely know the difference. So these are both cruciferous plants. Um, and they get that name because the flowers in the cruciferous family are always, there's always four petals, like a cross, so cruci cross. So we can ID it that way. And then we look at these two and you see, in addition to being different sizes, they're different colors. And then when we look at the seed pods between one and the other, those are really different too. So this is a wild mustard. And mustards are awesome. I love gathering mustards and I love cooking with wild mustards. So this is what their seed pods look like. And if we open one of these up, it's still really early in the season. You wanna gather the seeds when the seed pods turn brown. And I'm gonna split it open with my thumb nail here. And inside, probably won't be able to see this, but inside there's little teeny tiny seeds. They're still really super duper little now. Baby, baby little bitties. But when these seed pods turn brown and you can shake them, there's almost a little rattle to them. Um, you, you can just sort of garble them with your fingers. Garbling is when you, it's an herbalist term for breaking something down into the small sizes that you can use. So you can take these seed pods and rub them and garble them and then sort of lift them like that and the chaff will go off here and you'll be left with a bunch of teeny tiny little mustard seeds that you can grind up to make your own mustard or you can put them in pickles. Um, they're really, really tasty um, and they last a long time. And so that's the mustard over here. And when we look at the mustard leaves, they're a little bit thinner than over here our radish leaves so and they're also smaller so the flowers and the leaves are both smaller on the mustard than the radish and radish is a little bit rougher over here um, and the radish seed pods oh my goodness I ate one from my garden the other day and immediately I thought oh my gosh I might actually throw up this is so intense I didn't but like that's how strongly acrid and intense the flavor is and it makes you salivate and go, oh my gosh. 
So you can tell they're both really strong medicinal and culinary plants. And they also are totally edible raw. You don't have to cook them. You can add the flowers to your salad and they have a little bit of a bite to them, which is kind of fun. Here we have the elusive scarlet pimpernel. The flowers are open even though it's cloudy because it's going to get sunny later today. But you can see some flowers are still closed. And when the flowers are closed, uh, you, you can hardly spot it because the leaves are really small like chickweed. And then you have these bright little orange flowers that um, were sometimes carried by sea captains um, as a bar barometer because the plants respond to barometric pressure and you can tell if a storm is coming or whether the weather's going to get better by looking at these and like a lot of uh, weather reporters they're sometimes iffy and you can look at a plant and have, see half the flowers closed and half the flowers open. So 50-50, it's going to be nice. Um, anyway, it's the classic Scarlet Pimpernel made famous by Celia Thaxter. We are currently sitting in what's basically a wild garden and pharmacy all at once right now. Um, and we're surrounded by a lot of really fun plants, some of them useful edibles like this uh, walking onion or Egyptian onion that has kind of escaped and you can eat all of the green parts here and the little bulbils up at the top. And onions are really useful for coughs and respiratory concerns. They're also really antiviral, which is why we use them in fire cider or felon's vinegar or those other really great immune supports. Plus they're delicious. Um, and then right in front of that, we have a really young Artemisia here, Artemisia vulgaris, mugwort. And this mugwort is eventually, hopefully going to grow up to be nice and tall. Um, mugwort is a fantastic plant for a lot of reasons. Um, she's a sacred plant, um, so we can gather her and put her into smoke bundles. Um, and people use the leaves traditionally to help with lucid dreaming um, by putting them under their pillows at night um, to give really vivid dreams. This is a, a plant that's also really great for um, cramping either digestive cramping or menstrual cramping. So this is a really great ally for anybody who has a womb and um, gets their menstrual cycle. It's a good plant to know and you can just chew on the leaves or tincture them um, and take a couple of drops. And I like to take a tincture with me when I'm traveling if there's any like upset tummy. Um, there's a sweet bitterness to this plant. And when you, um, when you chew the leaves, you can kind of, it it almost kind of breaks down. It's not like a gum, like stretchy, but you can chew on them for a while and they stimulate the salivatory system and really do help um, that bitter flavor helps you to get ready to break down food more easily. So a nice addition before meals as well. There's a ton of things that you can do with mugwort. Also makes a really fabulous tea. Yes. Yes, mugwort in a tea is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I, I just love this plant, one of my absolute favorites. There's some thistles here behind us. There's a bladder campion, which I learned about last year here on Star Island. Um, and over here, we've got some little red clovers, um, which are edible for us and really super important for the pollinators. Clover is a really great lymphatic um, herb. So really helpful for um, whenever we have kind of stuck or like clumped up lymph nodes, really useful for um, breast health as well. And we can tell which clover this is because of the little lighter chevron markings on the, on the leaves here, the three leaves there. So that's an edible one and a lovely one. There's a little bit of purslane growing up over here. And purslane 
can get to be about this big. This is another one of those wild weeds that gets sold in gourmet farmers markets as like a really fancy pants vegetable. Um, and there's a lot of mucilage in there. So if you're somebody who has like issues with your knees and joints or digestion, sluggish digestion, you have a hard time eliminating, this might be a really good herbal ally for you. Over here, we have catnip. And I've been really enjoying watching this bee kind of coming around and going and visiting all of the little flowers here. Catnip's a wonderful herb, another one in teas that I really, really enjoy. Um, and catnip seems to be an herb that helps people relax and also focus more. So if you're somebody who maybe you're trying to stay focused on all of your Zoom schooling, might not be a bad idea to have some catnip tea or tincture at hand. And nice in a nice bedtime tea as well. And then another of my absolute favorites, this is a mullen here. And we have a couple of examples. We'll kind of go back and forth. This is a second year mullen plant. So um, mullen flowers in their second year. And they have these nice soft leaves here. They can get really, really big when they're in um, maybe a less intense, um, dry and windy environment. But these flowers have traditionally been used in ear oils, like in a garlic infused olive oil. You'd also infuse the mullen flowers. Um, and traditionally, they weren't dried, so they would kind of ferment a little bit in the oil and make an antibiotic, which was really a, an awesome thing that the, the ancient herbalists knew about. Mullen also has, sometimes you'll see the, um, the sap is, um, it turns dark colored as it's exposed, um, and it's very, very sweet, almost like a, like a molasses -y sweet. And so bees really like hanging around the mullen stalks. Over here, this is what mullen looks like in her first year. So this is a basil rosette. Um, and the leaves are big and soft. And um, you can see that they grow in this rose shape. And mullen leaves are used traditionally for asthma and respiratory concerns. So I put them in cough syrups or lung support tonics um, and I also use them in smoking blends and teas as well but it sounds weird to think of smoking something to help your lungs but mullen is one of those few herbs that actually it brings the medicine to the exact space it needs to be to help um, soothe and heal and open up the bronchioles so mullen is an awesome herbal ally to know about and if you see them growing in your garden let them be because the pollinators will love them and you'll have really good medicine from the roots to the leaves to the stalk and the flower. The whole plant's really awesome. So we're lucky to have them all here where we are. So we are surrounded by a ton of really fantastic edible and medicinal plants out here on Star. Um, two of the ones that are really useful to know about and really fun for kids to know about are pineapple weed and then the common plantain. So we'll start with pineapple weed. This is also called wild chamomile, uh, but we call it pineapple weed because the flowers themselves smell of pineapple. And you can see when you kind of break them up into little pieces, it's just like chamomile, but without the white flowers um, or petals coming out the sides. So this is a great one to make sun tea with, and it's very safe. It's good for an upset tummy, like Peter Rabbit's mama gave him chamomile tea. You can make your own wild chamomile tea by pouring boiling water on top of this, or you can use it as sun tea um, by pouring warm water over and leaving it in the sun to steep, which is what we do here at the Marine Lab. And this is the plantain, and you can see it's different from the one Arthur showed you earlier. Um, the leaves are very broad, and you can see that this one is sending up, these are the flower stalks that are now making little seeds. And those are mucilaginous and filled with fiber. So they're really good for people if they're constipated. You can make a tea out of that. Um, and it's really supportive of your whole digestive system. 
but I love using the leaves for something kind of gross and awesome called a spit poultice. So if you get a bee sting or a bug bite, what you can do to make it feel better is you take a clean plantain leaf, you always thank your plant when you gather from them, and then you chew it up and you're gonna put it right on the bite. And the reason we chew it up is because these leaves are so fibrous. You can see if you just tried to cut it up, it wouldn't be enough. So you have to use your molars and then you put that right on and you can put another leaf right on top to hold it in place or a bandana and it'll make the sting go away. So that is another great thing and they're perfectly safe to eat and great for kids to know an ID. This is Rosa Ragosa, one of Star Island's most noticeable and delightful resident plants. Rosa Ragosa is called that because it's a rose and Ragosa is um, Latin, it, it means rough. And so this is like a rough leafed rose. Um, there's a couple of different kinds of roses on stars. So that's how you can tell this one. And you can see this one's been chewed up a little bit by some insects because it's the end of the season. But the petals are not the only medicinal part. The leaves are medicinal, the petals are medicinal, and both edible and medicinal are also the hips. So this is like a little hip here that's starting and it's um, it's been pretty dry here. So this one's a little bit dehydrated, but in about a month, it's gonna be bright red and hopefully very succulent on the outside. And that fruit is filled with tannins or uh, excuse me, pectin. So you can use it to make jam um, and it has the natural gelling agent and it has a ton of vitamin C and the seeds inside are what rose hip seed oil comes from. And that's really good for your skin. Um, I love the blossoms in liqueurs and glycerites and in honeys. Uh, it's just a wonderful, wonderful plant. So we're lucky to be surrounded by them here. This is St. John's wort, Hypericum perforatum. A lot of people think of St. John's wort as an herb for seasonal depression, and it can be useful for that. But I really like using this herb as the potent antiviral that they are. And so they're antiviral and they're really good for nerve pain and sunburns, herpes outbreaks, a really fabulous herb. And one of the cool things about St. John's wort is that inside these blossoms is a red, oil that turns um, this tincture bright red. So this is just plain vodka that I have put some flowers into and over the past couple of weeks they've turned this almost fluorescent red color. And I'll show you how you can make this yourself. All you need is vodka and you could use brandy or other herbs. When the flowers are wide open like this or in these buds, if you pinch the buds between your fingers, they make this purple stain here. And that's that, that's that juice, that purple, purple juice. I called it oil earlier, but it's the juice of it. And um, that is what stains this and turns it bright red. So all you do is gather them. Always thank your plant. Make sure that you're leaving enough for the pollinators. And you put them in, cover them in alcohol. You can also make an oil with this as well. That's really good for sobs. Cover it up. We'll pour in some more to make sure it's all covered. Shake and leave it in the sunshine. And that's your St. John's Wort tincture. This is yarrow, also called Achillea millifolium. Millifolium because of the many, many leaves or little parts here, the leaflets that come out. And Achillea, named after Achilles of the Trojan War. This is considered a battle herb uh, because it stops bleeding. So this is a wonderful herb for kids to know about because, you know, when you're out playing, you usually get scrapes. And once you clean your wound, you can take the leaf and rub it and put it on your cut and it will stop the bleeding. The flowers work really well for that. And what I like to do is I like to cut them and dry them and then 
grind them up really, really, really fine in my mortar and pestle. S run them through a sieve, because you don't want any little sticks in your cuts. That would hurt. And then you have the powder, and you just keep the powder on hand for when you're hiking or running or riding your bike. And if you get a cut and you're kind of away from home before you have a Band-Aid, you can just put some of that powder on, and it stops the bleeding. This is also really good for internal bleeding or swelling, so it's fabulous for varicose veins and hemorrhoids. It's a really all-around fantastic herb. And that's just some of, some of the ways we use it, but definitely the best known ways. Tansy. And tansy is a common herb out here. Tansy used to be used more as a culinary herb, but it's not really safe for pregnant women to use, and people have sort of fallen away from using this as a food herb, although you can certainly have a little nibble. Um, that won't hurt you. But what I like to use tansy for the most is as a moth repellent. So when tansy is just like this, before they've really opened up and gotten really big and fluffy, you can cut the top third of the plant, and that leaves enough leaves for the plant to continue to photosynthesize and support the roots. And then you hang those dry. Um, you can put them in a paper bag or tie a rubber band around them and hang them to dry somewhere dark. Um, and then you take them after they're dry and put them in your closet with any clothing that you're concerned that moths will get into. And that's an awesome, awesome natural moth repellent that's safe for everybody to smell and um, it'll keep your clothes safe. And then another plant that's also something that keeps things safe, even though we're really scared of it, is poison ivy. Poison ivy is all over the place here at Star Island. If you stray off the paths, you're going to run into them. And that's the magic of poison ivy. Poison ivy tells people, hey, this isn't a place for you to go safely. Watch what you're doing. So even though we don't like poison ivy because we're scared that it's going to hurt us, for the planet, poison ivy is a really good protector plant. And for Star Island, poison ivy loves star just as much as you do. And their message here is like, hey, watch where you're going and don't go off the paths. And that's pretty good. It keeps the gulls happy. It keeps the plants growing really nicely and it keeps you safe and sound too. So there's something good to be said about poison ivy. This view that you're looking at now is the roots of mountains made when worlds collided 440 million years ago. We'll go into that tale in detail in just a moment. This here is the Gulf of Maine as it is today. This dot right here is Star Island and the Isles of Shoals. Hardly shows on the map, but this is the ecosystem that we're a part of and it's the story that we're going to show you. 440 million years ago, North America was this little section of continent and like India colliding with Asia and making the Himalayas, um, Africa and Italy colliding with Europe and making the Alps, we had Avalonia and Baltica sliding up and colliding with the continent of Laurentia. Slowly this o ocean closed and as this continental crust came, crust came in, it actually subducted under the other crust. And then the melted sediments from this ocean here came up as granite magma, granitic magma, underneath the mountains and pushed them up to a huge coastal range anywhere from two to 10,000 feet tall. 5 400 million years ago, that area had merged up here. That mountain building event, event is called the Acadian Orogeny in this hemisphere. But if you go over to Europe, 
that same event is called the Caledonian orogeny. And it created the mountains of Norway and the highlands of Scotland. Pangaea was still forming. We, a combination here of Laurentia and the Russian plate. And finally we get Pangaea. That final um, stage where Africa and Florida collided with the east coast below Cape Cod and created the Allegheny. So that was about 310 million years ago. Subsequent to that, Pangaea began to break up. And we have open water forming Northwest Africa peeling away, the Baltic states peeling away, England peeling away. Essentially, you had the Mid-Atlantic Rift finally became active before there was an Atlantic. And since then, the sea floor has spread with all this space between us. What we see in star a lot is those stretch marks as it started to crack up. They're basically false rifts. So it didn't just automatically form one rift in the middle. There were a lot of fissures that happened and those filled with basalt, which was oceanic crust, sort of iron rich dense magma that came up from the core and we see lines of that throughout the island. You see these networks elsewhere in the world as well. Um, you see them in England. Sometimes people call them ley lines and they might have a magnetic influence as well because they're, heavy, they're iron rich rocks. Um, but no mystical significance other than that is the residue of when the continents were one and then came apart. Okay. That's the general overview up until 200 million years ago. Um, at that time, these were still big mountains, even though they'd been eroding for 200 million years. Um, but the subsequent story here at Star um, is the Ice Age, which had a huge impact on what things look like today. If you look over at Appledore, you can see towards the mainland a slow, gradual shelf coming up. And over on the far side, you see cliffs tumbling down to the water where the waves have broken off pieces. Um, this general shape was formed by the glaciers slowly pushing away the surface area and moving out that way. So when it got to the far side of the hill, it just sort of fell off. Um, where we are now, we can come back to this map. Um, Cape Cod, George's Bank, all these are probably, like Long Island, the glacial moraine. This is where the glaciers extended to and dropped their big load of debris. All of this is kind of um, Duncan again because this area would have been dry land underneath the ice. Okay, we're going to take a look around the island to different sites that can show us in the rocks this whole story that we just kind of covered now. So we have a variety of kinds of and cracks with more silica combinations with other elements. Um, you'll notice some of this Very quickly. The granite 
when they weather. Um, over here we see, again, this was a fissure, but it went down really deep. And you'd get groundwater, meltwater would go down there and then it would heat up. There'd be all these dissolved minerals that then they'd come boiling up into this fissure and eventually um, come out of solution silica quartz crystals. There's another interesting weathering phenomenon that we find here, especially along the shore, where it's reminiscent of the philosopher's stones in, in China. Um, it's like Swiss cheese. It looks like um, it's this pocking that takes place in the granite. And then usually it's something that is wet part of the time where the waves come in or there's a lot of spray. There also tend to be a lot of gulls on it. Um, so one thing is that the water then maybe um, dissolves a little pore, a micro pore of mineral and a little bit of water gets in there and when that water freezes, it pops off the surface and that creates this kind of effect. And we're gonna go to uh, look at one of our dikes. Um, those are the ley lines that I talked about. All right, so this basalt dike is relatively uneroded. It's almost like a highway, in a way. And you can see this is really fine grain rock to the granite, um, but if you look closely, you can see banding and different minerals, many of which were melted from the granite when this came through, and so you have these little flecks of white and dark, and right here you have like a racing line pinstripe that comes down, uh, it goes straight along, and that's because there's a cooling zone, this thing was 10 feet wide or so, and the stuff in the middle is more coarse, pockmarked basalt, cooled much more slowly than the stuff towards the edges. And as it cooled and as it hit, you know, everything was dissolved in this magma. And then as it cooled, it settled out at different temperatures, certain things would um, 
that'll come out of solution. And so you get lines of minerals, which is like why gold often runs in veins. And we wouldn't find that here. Um, we do find veins of garnet um, and mica. We have all these little clusters, but all arranged in a straight line. It's sort of a fascinating large-scale chemistry experiment. Um, so remember this? This all formed as the continents were breaking apart. The granite came here as oceanic crust had been pushed by Avalonia, which was this other plate, into Laurentia, which was the proto-North America. And as it collided, the, the oceanic crust would subduct or be drawn under, and then that crust would melt, and in that remelt in along with all the sediments, then it came up as magma, some of which were volcanoes. Um, it would be something like the Alaska Coast Range, where you have a lot of, everything is like 2,000 feet tall, two, two to 4,000, and then you'll have the occasional 10,000 foot volcano. That's probably what this coast looked like at that time. Thank you so much for joining us on our visit to Star Island and exploration of some of the wonderful natural history.